about becoming saint. Um, so um, another way to, to talk about this is how Jesus was presented with this question. Um, Jesus had two people in the scriptures ask him this very question about uh, holiness. But the way they put this phrase is, uh, can all be saved or will only a few be saved? And one rich young man came to him and said to him, what do I need to do to uh, inherit a heaven? Uh, another a lawyer came to Jesus and asked, uh, what, what, what are the laws that's needed uh, that we need to follow in order to uh, inherit uh, salvation in heaven? So Jesus answers this question that 2,000 years ago people asked about. They didn't call it holiness, but it's the same question. Uh, nowadays, uh, one of the, this topic has kind of shifted a little bit. Uh, there's a, is it an Australian uh, man, uh, what's his name? He, he wrote the Rediscover uh, Jesus, Rediscover Catholicism, what's his name again? Uh, Matthew oh, Kelly. No. Matthew Kelly, yeah, yeah. He's the one that coined the term holiness is, uh, is uh, how does he put it? Uh, finding, uh, being the best version of yourself. And and I think that's in some ways it, it help is helpful, but I think in another way it can uh, be a little bit of distortion. But we're all trying to figure out what holiness is, and so for me, uh, what I try to do is go back to how uh, Jesus was asked this question: How can I get to heaven? I think it's a simple question. Anyone can understand that. Uh, now the question is: What do I have to do? Uh, to become a saint in order to go to heaven. So as I was reflecting on tonight's talk, I thought about three very particular passages in scripture. Uh, two, three, three uh, the first one is the Beatitudes, uh, where Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful. Uh, when Jesus talks about the blessed here, uh, he's giving us, in a sense, uh, a blueprint on experiencing a beatitude uh, because those who are in heaven uh, experience the beatific vision. And so one of the ways we can uh, uh, answer the call to holiness is if we really take the time to reflect on the beatitudes and each of them actually take, I mean, I myself have been you know, practicing this my whole life, and I still continue to do this. Uh, even and I'm still on the first one. What does it mean to be poor? To be poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and one of the um, people uh, living saints that I think uh, are is practicing that is Pope Francis, uh, and he himself purposely chose the name Pope Francis because he's trying to live out this first beatitude: "Blessed are the poor." And we know how St. Francis himself uh, loved the poor. He, he lived a life of poverty. He lived a simple life and he truly was blessed. He was truly happy when he, he gave up everything to follow Jesus. Uh, and so that's the first scripture passage. And if you're interested, that's in uh, Matthew chapter five. Uh, the second one is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, if you just read that parable, you would think, well, how, what does that have to do with uh, holiness? Uh, well, if we read a little bit of uh, uh, the context of this passage of the Good Samaritan, it actually comes from a lawyer who asked Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit uh, eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you're a lawyer. What do you think? And so he was able to answer correctly, you know, love God with your whole being and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you got it. Now go and do it. <laughs> uh, but then that's when he says, well, who is my neighbor? And then that's when Jesus, we hear Jesus saying, uh, giving the story of the Good Samaritan. So that's the second scripture passage, I think is very important in reflecting on this call to holiness. What does that look like? Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan actually does give us in that story, um, a story, a parable of what uh, the call to holiness looks like. 
Now, the third scripture passage that I thought about, which is very important, is the story of the rich young man who actually came to Jesus and says, you know, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? And Jesus says, you know, follow the commandments. And he says, I have done everything. I have followed the commandments. What am I missing? And that's when Jesus says uh, to him, well, if you wish to be perfect, and he, he uses that very word, if you wish to be perfect, then go and sell what you have, give to the poor, and then come follow me and you will have riches in heaven. So um, I, I'm not going to go into each of these passages um, because I think there's too much uh, in there, but I will talk about some of the things that I think are important uh, in this call to holiness and the pathway we need to take in order to go there. Uh, so the first thing that uh, we see in these three passages is the importance of the commandments. Both the parable of the Good Samaritan speaks about uh, following the two greatest commandments, love of God and love of neighbor. Uh, in the story of the rich young man, Jesus also asks the rich young man to follow the commandments, uh, but he kind of listed a few of the, the Ten Commandments. So the commandment is, is part of what is really essential uh, in following uh, this path to holiness. Uh, so that's the, the first, first thing you have to do. If you can't do that, then um, you can't, uh, you can't, you're not really following the path to holiness. But the second aspect uh, of it all is the question of perfection. Uh, Jesus speaks about if you wish to be perfect, then do this. Uh, and we hear in other places, Jesus telling his uh, apostles, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And then uh, following the same kind of pattern, Jesus will say, be holy as your heavenly father is holy. And then there's another one where he said, uses the same template, be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. And here I kind of want to stop and make a little distinction um, as a good Dominican. And that distinction is that uh, some of us, when we read like the story of the rich young man, we think the only way to become holy is to do exactly what that man did. Give up everything, sell my everything and follow Jesus. And, uh, or like St. Francis, you know, he did the same thing. He took even off his clothes. He was butt naked uh, when he, he gave up everything to follow Jesus. But I think this is a, there's a danger because getting to heaven doesn't mean you have to literally do that, especially depending on your state in life. Um, and so Jesus uh, says, if you wish to be perfect, he, he was offering to certain people this counsel that in religious life we call uh, the evangelical councils. The evangelical counsel is a counsel from Jesus that kind of goes above and beyond uh, what uh, a normal person would be expected to do. Uh, a normal person, you, we would imagine, would have a family, would have, might have children, and they need to go to work in order to pay the bills and all that. But here, certain people Jesus invites uh, to literally uh, give up everything and devote their whole life to Jesus. That's why Jesus called these 12 apostles, and he really challenged them to give up everything. Uh, and so in order to follow Jesus, uh, you know, the church has uh, understood that as, you know, giving up our own will so that we become perfectly obedient. So that's the first vow and the most important uh, vow of all. And the other two would be uh, the vow of poverty and the vow of uh, celibacy. Now, you know, if, if everybody started doing that, vow of poverty and celibacy, we wouldn't have any, a lot of Catholics left in the world. <laughs> uh, so the distinction is that in order to be holy, you don't have to be a religious, you don't have to be uh, a cleric, you don't have to be a, a sister. And so this is where uh, it's, it's good because many people, I think, have this attitude that, oh. Are you searching for treasure, love? I'm sorry? 
So many people think that the only way that they can become saints and, and become holy is if somehow they become religious. Uh, when in fact, holiness is not a call just for those who are entering religious life. Uh, holiness is a call that happens the moment we are baptized. Our baptism is that calling to, to holiness. And, and each of us, whether we were, are religious or whether we're not religious, whether we're married or whether we're single, uh, each of us can attain holiness each in our own way. And so I remember preaching about this one time and it really blew a lot of the parishioners mind thinking that what? I can be holy as well without being a religious? It's as if they've never had this idea that they can be holy without being a religious. Because uh, in their mind, it was so ingrained that the only type of holiness are those who enter religious life. And that's just not true. Uh, we know of plenty of saints who are married, uh, married men and women. We know plenty of saints who were big sinners and they became saints. And that's really the story of humanity. Uh, is that every single one of us, uh, by virtue of our baptism, and in, in each our own way, can uh, become holy and become saints. Now, because each of us can become saints, and we're in such different states in life, um, that now it becomes important for each and every one of us, if we're taking the path of holiness, we need to go through what, um, you know, the fancy word is, uh, we have to go through uh, a discernment uh, to discover that path that Jesus has given to us, that God has given to us, uh, depending on our state in life, whether we're single, whether we're married, whether we are religious, if we're faithful to that and how, how that path will take us. So um, another way of saying all of this is that there are different styles of holiness. Um, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, there's, there's what I call a, a feminine style of holiness, and there's a masculine style of holiness. And you see it like in the history of the saints, you know, there are plenty of great saints. And when I think of the feminine uh, styles of holiness, I think of like the great uh, saints, like St. Saint Catherine of Siena, St. Saint Hildegard of Bingen, St. Therese, Saint Therese of Lisieux, all these uh, women saints who had their own, for lack of a better word, style of holiness. And so is the men too, they, they have their own style. Uh, and we can talk about uh, different kinds of uh, spirituality that leads to holiness. Uh, for us, uh, one of the ways that we grow in holiness is if we are faithful to living the Dominican spirituality. Uh, but that's not the only way to become holy and become saints. We have Franciscans who are saints. So there's a Franciscan way of becoming holy. We have a Jesuit way. And you, some of you may think, how is that possible? But yes, there is a, such a way as saying Jesuit style of holiness that, that can help people become holy. You know, there are plenty of Jesuit saints. Uh, so it's not like if you're a Jesuit, you can't be holy. But what it does mean is that you have to really uh, live faithfully that charism of that saint to grow in holiness and but this is where you know for some people they they feel more called to a Carmelite spirituality that will lead them to holiness some people feel more called to the Dominicans others to the the Jesuit whatever way I, I think the key is that they strive to be faithful and authentic witnesses of those spirituality to help them grow in holiness. Um, so as I repeat again, holiness can happen through married life, through single life, through religious life, not just only religious uh, can become holy. Everybody can become holy. Um, and I think the, the good news for all of us is that nobody is born a saint. Nobody's born holy. Uh, all of us are born with the uh, uh, original sin, but uh, through baptism, through the sacraments of the church, we move from being sinners to becoming saints. And another way I describe holiness 
uh, is that uh, we are saints in the making, saints in the making. Uh, and if, if we are conscious of that fact and that reality that we're con continually growing in holiness, then, then we are living our calling to holiness. We are fulfilling our baptismal call to holiness. And so I think um, that's, that's kind of in a nutshell uh, how I see uh, this, this talk about holiness and how, how we can become saints. Uh, now, if we're speaking in more of what I call um, practical terms, uh, I can't say this one person needs to do it exactly this way. None of us can, can uh, I can't say like all of us need to follow exactly uh, the way, the path of St. Dominic. Uh, in some ways we need to share that because of the spirituality we, we have uh, in, as Dominicans. Uh, but St. Dominic had his path that God led him. Uh, each one of us will have our own path as well. Uh, we do share some things like the path uh, in Dominican spirituality, but there are other things that are not going to be the same. Uh, I, as a religious, will have a path that's very particular, and you, as married or single, will have your own path as well. Uh, but that path, first of all, needs to be rooted, I believe, in living the commandments, and secondly, be rooted in uh, living in the church living in the church. There's no way uh, I believe that you can really become holy uh, outside. Now, that's not to say that, you know, if you're outside of the church, you're, you're not going to be saved. Um, but what Jesus Christ himself instituted uh, was a way, a very clear way for us to, be, to grow in holiness. He instituted the church. He also instituted all these sacraments to help us grow in holiness because Jesus knew that uh, we would, you know, go astray, and so because of that, he instituted the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of forgiveness, and so when we do go astray, our path back to holiness is through the sacrament of reconciliation, but there are all, the, all these other sacraments, too, and the reason why there are all these other sacraments, too, is because holiness, part of holiness is about us becoming conformed and made more and more into the image and likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why uh, we need to be conform uh, into the image and likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus himself is the Holy One, the Holy One of God. Even, even Satan, when, uh, or one of the evil spirits, when uh, the spirit saw Jesus, he says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And so... Jesus uh, is the one that uh, brings about our holiness. We, our actions alone uh, do not make us holy, no matter how good it may be. It has to be uh, connected to, to our Lord Jesus, and it has to be connected to the church. Uh, because Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, he said, I'll be with you always. Uh, and the way he is with us is in the church and in the sacraments. And so how do we become like Jesus in his image and likeness? Uh, first of all, it requires baptism. In baptism, we have received this gift of being called uh, children of God. Jesus himself was a son of God. So first of all, we need to be called sons and daughters of God. And that's the first step in the path to holiness. After that, uh, we have the other sacraments. Uh, for example, in the sacrament of anointing of the sick, uh, how when we receive that, we are now sharing a, and becoming made more in the image and likeness of Jesus by uh, sharing in Jesus' own suffering when he carried the cross uh, and he was suffering greatly. When we receive that sacrament, we become made in the image and likeness of Jesus in his suffering. And of course, uh, in the Eucharist, uh, when we eat his body, drink his blood, uh, we become like Jesus, uh, which is uh, very unique because what we eat, uh, it becomes like us. But when we consume the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, we become like our Lord Jesus. And so that's, um, that's I think, uh, one of the necessary things that needs to happen. And I see that actually when I reflect on 
that parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, we see the Good Samaritan, we see in the Good Samaritan, our Lord Jesus himself, uh, taking care of this man left half dead. But notice what Jesus does after he takes this man to uh, an inn and asks the innkeeper to care for this man. And in my mind, this inn is actually the church. The innkeeper is, are the people who are supposed to be the ones who take care of the church. And so we think of those as the bishops and priests of the church. Uh, and so I, I find this kind of an amazing um, sense analogy. Uh, the, the, the innkeeper is the church. And so the church is caring for each one of us, each and every one of us. Pope Francis himself uh, one time described the church as a field hospital. And to me, it's kind of like what's happening in this parable of the Good Samaritan, where the Good Samaritan takes him to the inn to take care, to care for this man injured, to heal this man. Uh, and so that image is the perfect image of what the church is about. Uh, and the, the Good Samaritan says that he will come back and whatever is owed, he will pay. And that's kind of like the image of the second coming. Uh, so this is, um, you know, when we're talking about the path to holiness, living the commandments, but it's just not about living the commandments. It's also about living in community, in the church. And so for us Dominicans, we, we make that very clear in our Dominican life. The church is the community of believers, uh, but the community of the believers doesn't just get together, you know, each Sunday to celebrate the Eucharist. Uh, we we take community life to another level. Jesus, when he formed his apostles for holiness, he, he was very conscious in that he wanted to form a community of these disciples uh, and really form them by teaching them uh, and, and helping them to learn to live in community. That's why in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, they talk a lot about they have held everything together in common. You know, whether it's recreation, whether it's food, whether it's money, all this, they really strove to live that common life, which is totally Dominican. Uh, but I'm just kind of emphasizing one aspect of uh, what it looks like when we take the path of holiness as uh, a Dominican, following Dominican spirituality. Uh, so, so that's, uh, those I think, I think are the basics uh, of this path of holiness. The next thing I, I find is important in this path to holiness is taking uh, or developing what I call virtues. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, was very insistent that when it comes to ethics, uh, the path he wanted to take was uh, virtue ethics, which a lot of that he took from Aristotle. And Aristotle himself will talk about the different virtues, you know, the, the cardinal virtues. But St. Thomas More takes it the next step and talks about both the cardinal virtues as well as the theological virtues. And the reason why virtues are important for us is uh, that it's, it's what kind of what people see when they see a, a, a holy person. For example, if you have the virtue of patience, they're like, oh, wow, this person is very patient. Uh, they're not just, you know, making a patient act. They're, that's who they are. <laughs> they're just a very person, person by nature, or that at least they've developed that virtue. Uh, and there are other virtues too, virtues of prudence, temperance, fortitude. Uh, and there's the theological virtues. And that's what um, we can't develop ourselves. That's something that only grace God can give to us. And that's part of the reason why it's called theological because it comes from God, but its goal or its aim or object is God too. So uh, to have the faith, faith in whom? Faith in God. To have hope, to have hope in whom? Hope in God. And love, love for whom? Love for God. And who gives us all this, uh, this gift of faith, hope, and love? It's God. <laughs> so it's not like we, we uh, worked at it and, and developed it. Um, 
And I think all of this is, is important uh, in developing uh, the path to holiness. The other thing I find that's important to developing uh, and discerning this path to holiness for each one of us is the discerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to all of us. We call the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there are also in Act in um, let's see in Romans twelve and I think in forget the other. There's maybe it have been First Corinthians twelve. These two chapters talk about uh, the importance of discovering your charisms. And each one of us, uh, God gives certain charisms. And if we recognize these charisms of the Holy Spirit. Uh, then we're, we're following this path of holiness uh, because we're not just using our hard work, but we're uh, being uh, sensitive to the, this particular gifts that God has given to each one of us. And, and if we're fully exercising that, then we're exercising special gifts that will build up the community. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, one charism is the charism of teaching. Some people uh, teach because they went to school and studied and learned the skills, uh, but others, the Holy Spirit has given them this special gift that it's naturally easy for them to teach people and they can easily understand and they, they, they flourish, they, they are happy that they're able to teach uh, others um, about God or about whatever topics that, that they, they are teaching. Others have... Um, the gift of prophecy, the charism of prophecy. Um, and so they use that gift. Uh, there's the, the charism of healing, uh, an intercessory prayer. There's a whole bunch of these gifts. And I think part of the path of growing in holiness is also taking the time to discover and discern what are the charisms that have been given to us. The Catherine, St. Catherine of Siena, uh, it's, what is it called? Is a group that used to be headed by uh, the Dominican province, uh, but now it's 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 kind of its own separate or organization. They help people to discern these charisms. Um, so I think uh, that's that's you know a small part of what it means to take this path to holiness. Uh, now, if you don't have all that time, uh, Saint Paul tells us, you know, I can be the greatest prophet, I can be the greatest teacher, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. So one easy path for, for us to take is just to follow St. Paul's uh, advice uh, that ultimately uh, it's about love. And if we are exercising that, then we're, we're on the path to holiness. Uh, uh, St. Uh, Augustine says, love and do what you will. Uh, St. Therese of Lisieux says, do small things with great love. So as you can see, they all kind of go back to this thing we call love and how important it is. Uh, so even if you don't know your charism, uh, the fact that you're doing what you can with great love, you're leading and following on that path of holiness. Uh, well, I should maybe stop here and see if there are any other questions. Is the organize, organization you're talking about, Sherry Waddell's? Yes, that's um, the one. Yes, yes. Okay, Forming Intentional Disciples. Yeah, so that's the books that she wrote. And um, that book isn't specifically on um, discovering your, your charism. But after um, going out around the world to help parishioners and people to discover their charism, one of the things she saw was that a lot of people um, miss this other facet of you know, this path to holiness is you may know what your charism, but how do you incorporate that? Because charisms are meant for uh, a community. It's not meant for yourself. It's not meant to make money. It's meant to build up the community of believers. Uh, and so forming intentional disciples here is a way of her trying to now help these people recognize this is part of their discipleship. Uh, discipleship, a stewardship, apostleships are all paths to holiness. And so she was just now beginning to kind of help them take the next step once they know what it is their charism looks like.
Any other questions? So I've been um, reading a book by Father uh, Jock Philippe. I'm probably butchering his name. Uh -huh. Pitching for and maintaining peace. Uh -huh. And he talks a lot about um, just how to, like that we're going to fall or we'll sin or, or whatever, because we try not to, but it this happens, but maintaining our peace and almost like an abandonment to God, like being confident in God's ability to, to just raise us up. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that, on the maintaining your peace or maintaining peace in God and, mm -hmm. and that path to holiness. Well, I think peace is very important. And, and I always link it back to Jesus and what Jesus says to us. Because uh, everything Jesus says, we, we can reflect on. The one passage that Jesus tells his disciples, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. We hear that in the Mass all the time. And not as the world gives, uh, but I give to you. So the kind of peace that Jesus gives to us is a very unique peace. Uh, and I think that is... Those who are at peace are the people who have actually taken the time to discern not so much what they want, but what is the will of God in their life. And when they get to a point where they think this is where God leads me and they make the uh, courageous effort to follow that path, what usually happens is they experience one of the what we call the fruit of the spirit. And so one of the the church you know, lists about like 12 fruits, love, peace, you know, patience. Uh, all, all of these are, are fruits of the spirit. So if you're actually following the spirit and, and following God's will, one of the effects of that is the experience of peace. And I've seen it in my own life where when I've really made the, some effort in prayer and discerning uh, in prayer directions uh, where God wants me to, to go. And if you're doing that, you're actually following the path of holiness. The path of holiness is always the path where God wants you to go. Uh, we just have to remember that the path that I take may not necessarily be the path that God, other people uh, are called to take. Uh, but the effect that I felt after making this discernment was a sign, uh, sense of peace. Uh, I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me a sense of peace. Like when I was, for example, discerning um, my uh, state in life, call whether God was calling me to the priesthood, to the Dominicans. Um, and um, it's not easy, but after a long period of discernment um, and you make that decision, uh, you can sense, oh yeah, I think this, I feel very at peace with this decision. So uh, I think it's all part of that path to holiness. I think one thing I would even uh, would stress when it comes to um, following the path of holiness is that as human beings, we have to um, accept that not all of our actions, uh, not everything we say or do is going to be exactly on that path of holiness. Uh, we're going to like say the wrong thing, take the wrong path, and it's like, oh, okay, that wasn't the path that I should be going. Uh, but what's amazing to me and, and where God is so merciful is that the sacrament of reconciliation leads me back on the right path. And I always feel like, oh, you know, I don't have to be concerned that everything I say or do have, has to be perfect, uh, has to be holy, because I know it won't, I won't be able to do that, everything. So, but I know that I'm always on the general path, right path, uh, after I recognize when I've gone on the wrong path and, and go to confession. Good. Anyone else have a question? So would you then recommend um, the, the forming intentional disciples as a, a way of figuring out the gifts of the Holy Spirit or? that you received or how do we go about? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Sherry Waddell, I've been to a number of the talks that she's given on how, helping you to discern your charism. Uh, she, she, she said that uh, there are in some initial steps, like you take this inventory of the standard 24 charisms that uh, that's kind of listed in the, the Bible. But she also is, is uh, honest enough to say that those first 
few uh, tests that you take, inventory that you test, it starts the, the, the discernment process. But for some people, it takes them like years to really truly dis, uh, figure out what their charisms are. Um, yeah, I've taken, I've taken the, the, I have the inventory test. I've taken it a few times and each time it's come up with different things because I've had different life experiences exactly. in between each time, but I have not yet taken the time to actually do the discernment yet. I feel like I need to take it again because I've had even different experiences. It really, I took it right after being a parish coordinator. And so like I was high on everything like, yes, I've done all of So it's like sometimes it's experience based where you get high on a lot of things, which doesn't help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It right. doesn't help you discern anything because you're like, okay, so that means giving me zero information. I just have experience with these things. Doesn't mean I'm gifted in these things. I've just been sometimes forced into these situations. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Yeah. leadership wise, you know, like sometimes you do things that you know, you're told to do. So it is a discernment. And it sometimes your gifts aren't necessarily things that you've had experience in yet. So that's why discernment is important. Yes. <laughs> but also, yeah, no, you're absolutely 101% right. Uh, and it, it requires also um, meeting with somebody like Sherry or somebody who's uh, kind of knowledgeable about charisms. Because some charisms, they, they seem kind of the same. Like one charism is called helps, another is called uh, service. Uh, and you may like, be really high on help, but maybe your real charism is service. Uh, one is more focused on, on the person and others on things. Um, so a person who's more knowledgeable on the different charisms may also be able to help you uh, distinguish some of the charisms. There's also another tool that they use, which is uh, when, you are, when you score high on one particular charism, uh, you have to discern whether um, uh, this is a whether this is a charism or, or a real good skill that you've learned and developed mm -hmm. um, and another tool that they use is when you score high on something uh, can you recall from your experience uh, other people saying something to that effect that you you're really a good teacher or you you're a really good listener uh and so just from the experience you've seen in your life, uh, does it resonate with what other people say about you? That's like another uh, clue that perhaps you do have this charism. But, I, but to, to answer your question, the forming intentional disciple, I don't think goes directly into that. Talk to Alana. She she has the inventory. And so she would. I got the books. You know me. I got all the okay, books. Okay, you got all the books. <laughs> <laughs> we need somebody to be the librarian i seriously that's been like my goal for years i'm like when i was in italy the the base um library had like zero catholic books i'm like well that's my job right like new mission started you know so just kind Sounds of like your charism <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I'm not organized. So not that type of librarian, more like a hoarder. <laughs> if you're like, me, if you're like me, it's like, where is that book? Where is that book? I saw it the other day. I'm tr now starting to try to put authors together so I can find them, but you know, some are, oh, I've read them and I remember seeing them here, but if I move them, then they'll never be found ever. So, you know, <laughs> And there's also a point where even the, the book becomes limited uh, because the Holy Spirit is not just limited to having four, 24 charisms <laughs> available. It's just what's listed in the Bible, but uh, charisms, you have, may have a very special gift uh, that, uh, that's yet to be discovered. <laughs> yeah, or a combination of gifts. Or a combination of gifts, yeah. But for me, I would think that um, the charism is something if you really want to pursue it is, is great. Uh, but if, if you don't have the time right now uh, in, in this path to holiness, uh, do what St. Therese says, do what St. Augustine says, do what Pope Fra Francis says about it. You know, do, do small things with great love. Every little thing, whether it's in the home 
or, or outside or in your workplace. Just do it with great love. That's a very simple, but very effective um, recommendation. Grow in virtue. That's what I would say. You guys, you guys know me. Grow in the virtues. <laughs> Amen. That's good. Uh, thank you. Very good. Um, yeah, we did uh, some study with regard to to the the fact that the obeying the commandments. And you read in one John two three. It's if you love Jesus, you'll obey his commandments. And then you speak of the evangelical councils as what have you heard you say is counsels on the way to become more perfect, not just in obedience to the commandments that the young man had that baseline of his whole life, mm -hmm. but the additional counsel is to is an additional uh, effort to to follow Christ uh, in in his way, and this includes virtues and the evangelical counsels specifically, mm -hmm. where where one can. Uh, in accordance with one state in life. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair restatement? Yeah, yeah. The The way I looked at it, that passage uh, with a rich young man was that he was following uh, what every good Jew had to do, which was to follow the commandments. Uh, and when he said he did that, then and Jesus, his, his answer both to him and to this lawyer is, do this and you will have life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I take that to mean all of us, if, if we wanna have life, this is what we need to do. But there are some people that God invites uh, to follow kind of above and beyond this uh, really uh, necessary thing, which is to poverty, celibacy, and to obedience, this, this um, almost completely giving of your life. And that's where Jesus distinguished between if you want half life or if you want to be perfect. Yeah. So that's, that's how I read it um, is that, uh, but that is one particular path that Jesus invites some people, but that's not the only path to holiness uh, because there are plenty of other people in Jesus' time. You know, I think of, uh, others who follow Jesus, Mary Magdalene, uh, the other women, uh, other disciples uh, who, who followed Jesus. And, and so Jesus wasn't so insistent that, you know, they, they had to do that same, follow that same three evangelical council that he asked of his apostles. Right. That's beautiful. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Hearing none, we want to thank you, Father, for joining yeah. us tonight and everyone else, everybody from Texas and Florida and California as well, um, and everyone else around from the Boise area. Thank you for being with us, Father. It's really, really good. We'll have to do this again. Yeah. And uh, it's very, uh, it helps, it helps a lot, especially in the season we're in and in the world today, that we can choose a path that that is uh, not, not necessarily stress-free, but stress-free because of the world, but certainly gives us a path to walk despite where the world is headed. Amen. So thanks be to God. Um, so thank you. Were, yeah. were any other comments from anyone? Okay, well, thank you, Father. Appreciate your time, Father. Yeah, yeah. it's good to see all of you. Bonnie, yeah. I think Bonnie wants to say something. Go ahead, Bonnie. Well, I think Lorette wants to say something. She's on the phone. She's on the phone with me. Hey, we lost her. Oh. Thank you. It's just wonderful to hear everything you had to say. You make perfect sense. And uh, we all, I want to become holy. That's all I work on every day from a moment to moment basis. That's how I do it. <laughs> moment to moment. Amen. So, so much for sharing with us. Some moments are better, some moments are worse. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, forgiving, loving, loving, and forgiving. Yes. All day, every day. Thank you. So that, that's my secret to holiness. <laughs> so thank you, Father. I just, yes. Everything 
you said is perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Paul, yeah. In closing, could you give us a, a blessing? Yes. Um, and part us on our way. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be thank to God. You, God. Yeah. Thank All right. You. Talk Take to care. you soon. Take care. Talk to you thank soon. Thank you, Father. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, John, for recording. Thank you, Alana.